Welcome to the FNO InsureTech Podcast, a place where movers and shakers from all points within the insurance ecosystem gather and discuss all things InsureTech. We talk about how technology and innovation are affecting and driving change in the industry. Here are your hosts, Matt D. Fothery, Lee Boyd, and Rob Beller. Hey, podcast world. Welcome to another edition of FNO InsureTech with your hosts. That, that, I, was, that I was setting you up there. I mean, you do it different every time. How do I know it's my turn? Well, I got to keep you on your toes. It's an on your toes thing. Oh, okay. Right? So, so now that you're on your toes with our mm-hmm. hosts. Rob Beller. Hi, everybody. You see what I did there? I kept you uh, on That's what toes. I was looking for. I was looking for that grand introduction. Okay, we can go now. Thank you for joining us today. And with your other host. And with your other host, the one, the only, Lee Boyd. Hi, everybody. How are you, Lee? You know, I'm good. It's a, mm-hmm. it's a privilege to be here. It's a nice rainy day today. Really? In the city of Waco. I didn't even know that. Yeah, yeah. You know what's interesting I was listening to one of our intro to our podcast that just came out um, recently, and I was talking about how Texas is open, right? COVID's yes. done. Yes. We don't wear a mask around here. Everyone pretends like nothing happens. Well, it's a different story today, Rob. Tell we me, have, tell me what's going what's, You know, Texas is kind of, uh, yeah. are they taking a step back? We have seen a lot of cases here in my county. And we are now supposed to wear masks. It's um, the the cities have come out and said wear mask anytime you go into a business. And I actually, you know, my gym is still open, but I went at lunch and I had to wear a mask into the gym, in the locker room. I didn't have to wear it on the treadmill because they're they're separated, but I had to wear it while I lifted weights. And we are a, we're a mask city again. We are wow. uh, nothing's closing, but but we are watching ourselves. So it's uh, wow. It's an ever-changing world. You know, Lee, I sent you an article yesterday, which I'm sure you looked at. I did. That identified McLennan County, where Waco, Texas is, as a hot, as a national hotspot. Yes. And that's wow. true. That's true. I think we saw, you know, up until about a week ago, eight was our record. I think back in March, we had six a day, positive cases. And then we had eight. And just for example, on Sunday, we had 61 and so wow. it went from like, you know, six to 20, 40, 60. Yeah. So it's a lot. It's a whole lot. So what we have to say to you out there in podcast world is you can't stop being careful now. Right. We all want it to be over. We all want to go back to normal. Everybody does, of course. But please yes, be careful. Of course. Yes. Please be careful. So in other words... We have a lot of data on this, don't we, Lee? We have a lot of data on this. That's exactly right. Wouldn't it be interesting if there was a company that had like billions of property records stored that they could derive and take and use data from? That would be fascinating if only there was one. If, well, Lee, you might be happy to know and surprised that there is. I am shocked. It's called Core Logic. And their executive in charge of insurance and spatial solutions is our guest today, Mr. Steve Brewer. This is going to be a great conversation. The guy who is running the insurance segment of CoreLogic, a massive company that serves the underwriting world, the claims world, real estate world, so many other verticals. I'm very excited to talk to this guy. I think he's going to have a a wealth of knowledge for us. This is a guy who has the top seat in a data company, a data and technology company, I think we can say, Mm -hmm. and is forming the strategy and the roadmap for CoreLogic in the, in the, in the, in the vertical of insurance. So it's a really wonderful opportunity for us to talk to somebody who's at the apex and at the crossroads of all this information and all this technology and what do you do with it and how do you use it to the, to the greatest benefit of your customer? Yeah. And I'm very, very excited because think about it. We're going through this COVID thing. We're going to be able to talk about 
what our insurers are wanting, what the insurance companies are wanting, and and how we're pivoting. So let's let's do it. Let's jump in. Let let's have the conversation. Because, like we said at the top, and we kind of learned this from from Steve in the interview before COVID was BC. BC. After COVID is AC. So what are we Correct. now? Well, we're we're DC. We're DC during during, during COVID. COVID. We're during COVID. So. So in 20 years, when they listen to this podcast, when it's a classic, one of the classic editions, classic podcast, classic podcast edition, they'll, they'll say, wow, it was DC. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There you go. So without further ado, here is our interview with Stephen Brewer, executive in charge of insurance and spatial solutions at CoreLogic. Hey, everybody. We are here with a guest that we have been trying to track down now for, for some time. And I actually, with the help of Astrid, there's our shout out to Astrid, with her help, cornered you at the Symbility Conference in January when you really had no choice but to say yes, got you to say yes. <laughs> but at long last, here we are sheltered in place. Ladies and gentlemen, Steve Brewer, the executive in charge of the insurance vertical at CoreLogic. Did I say that right? Is that Absolutely. Your, give Absolutely. us your title. Uh, Executive in, of Insurance and Spatial Solutions. Okay, great. At CoreLogic. And we we're talking a second ago, CoreLogic is not this little easily described company, but we're going to ask you to do that in a couple of minutes. Tell us what CoreLogic is, and after you do that, kind of what you do there. Sure. Uh, well, actually, I have a little experience answering this because uh, it happens every time I go home for the holidays and my family <laughs> asks me the same things. So, so we'll, we'll give it a go. I'll tell you what I tell them. CoreLogic, it, it really is pretty simple. We help families and businesses find, buy, and protect their properties. So if it has something to do with that, really anywhere around the world, North America, Europe and Australia, New Zealand, there's a chance that CoreLogic's participating in that real estate e ecosystem. And so that's really our true north. And for us here in North America, primarily, we look at everything that has to do with a real estate transaction. We help renters find and landlords uh, screen renters for new applications. We help realtors through hosting uh, multiple listing service boards. So we help them and their customers uh, find and, and ultimately buy property. Uh, and then in mortgage, we really help on a lot of fronts in terms of validating borrower credentials, as well as uh, really valuing collateral that's used to underwrite mortgages in uh, North America. And then of course, in insurance, we'll spend a lot of time there today, but it's really about helping insurance carriers both identify, quantify, quote, and underwrite risk, as well as react in real time to assess damage, estimate reconstruction or, or replacement of loss, and ultimately be there in a policyholder's moment of need. So that's the glue that holds us together is that dedication to the property ecosystem. And, and, and really, it's an exciting platform to be a part of as our industry and you know many of the real estate industries undergo the transformation we're in today. So Hopefully that helps. That's a really high level view, but that's what I tell my parents. If anyone <laughs> actually is in a property transaction and you, you read the fine print of any of those pieces, whether it's the real estate platform and app or the mortgage app or even your app for insurance, uh, you'll, you'll see CoreLogic show up a few times and throughout each of those parts of the journey. We saw that you have 4.5 billion records in your data pool or so, give or take <laughs> several hundred million. So in other words, you guys are in insurance is because you have so much property information and that wealth of property information enables all kinds of interesting opportunities on the insurance side. Is that, am I thinking about that right? Yeah, I think that's pretty accurate. Our insurance practice is really compiled through a, a combination of acquisitions as well as uh, investments we've made. And it's pretty accurate to think about it in terms of the, the content, which would be the data analytics and insights combined now with technology and workflow. So we think about you know the claim space and, and all the transformation going on to really affect change and a different outcome for our industry. We have to combine all the data, all the advanced analytics and workflow to, to truly change how we do business and help our, our clients uh, change how they do business. And so that's really what's exciting to me is, is bringing together multiple disciplines of not just the content, which is critical, 
but also then the workflow that, that can pair with that to really deliver the end result. So that's how we think about our business, especially within the insurance space, bringing those two worlds together. And then, and then thinking through the interoperability or how it connects then with all of our partners in the ecosystem and ultimately out to a consumer. So what is your job there? And I see where it's uh, an executive of insurance and spatial solutions. I'm very interested in that. What, what do you do? Well, every day is a different day, but what I do is I lead the insurance business here at CoreLogic. We sit within a portfolio of those other solutions. So for example, our segment of CoreLogic has our insurance business, which is what many of our clients are and your listeners know. We also have the pure businesses in real estate and mortgage and appraisal and, and some of the other components. So I have the ultimate humbling uh, responsibility of leading the business and ultimately deciding you know, where the market wants us to go, what investments we need to make to help get there and uh, leading the charge. So it's an exciting, uh, no, no two days are alike, but ultimately uh, have the honor of leading the business and charting our course forward. Yeah, and that's a very exciting time, especially Uh, right now, because I think a lot of the industry is changing and some of the desires are different. I want to talk a little bit about the purchase of the estimating platform Symbility. Does that fall underneath you? It does. Yeah, it's been a very exciting uh, journey. And Symbility is really one of the, the most important pieces of that puzzle that we've been assembling. It's actually been, believe it or not, we just passed the 18 month mark since that was announced. Yeah, December of what would that be? 2018, ultimately, was December 18th, I believe. So I've worked hand in hand with James Swayze, who I believe was a, a former uh, uh, alumni of this podcast yes. and uh, yeah. shared some of the early vision that we had uh, w- when he and his, his team came on board. So what about Symbility drew you to it? Why Symbility? Why did that meet the need of CoreLogic? Well, there's there's several uh critical uh, components that, that really Symbility added. And if you step back a second and we look at the bigger picture of, of the transformation that's happening in, in property insurance and specifically the claims market, it's really all about a different customer experience. It's about shortening cycle times and adding efficiencies. It's about you know promoting uh, the adjusters and the professionals in the field to spend more time advising clients and less time you know, filling out paperwork. And so to get to that outcome, we need to have the content. We need to know when the loss happened. We need to be able to scope that loss efficiently. We we may be able to also pre-assess some of the potential impacts. But as importantly, we need to deploy technology to connect those professionals in the ecosystem, take advantage of the information we know, whether it was forensic data of of a hailstorm that came through or whether it is a post-event imagery, we have to combine that knowledge, that information with a workflow that professionals can collaborate on to really respond in that consumer's moment of need. That's the only way we can truly help our clients change the experience. The Symbility platform you know, has for a while been the, the most modern and interoperable cloud native platform in the industry. It just really hadn't enjoyed as much market adoption as perhaps a James and team team would like. And, and they've they've discussed that. The hypothesis or our thesis was that together with the scale of CoreLogic, the CoreLogic's content, um, which we had integrated already, but really bringing our businesses together was a true opportunity to help our industry evolve and transform through all these uh, demands, let's say, that our consumers and that our uh, CFOs are are placing on our business today. So uh, it's just a, a tremendous opportunity and one we're very, very excited about to blend the technology with our content and really, uh, listen to our clients on uh, how we can help be a part of the industry's future. So with 18 months in the books, how's the vision coming? Is it moving along the way you want it to? Very exciting. And it's really, we we talk here a lot about claims, but uh, it's really a broader vision. Our goal is really to provide a a true enterprise solution for our clients. And uh, we we have a lot of capabilities and data analytics that start in the marketing side where we're looking at digital audiences, we're trying to figure out, you know, propensity models of who's likely to move soon and, and what what demographics exist. We blend that with a lot of the uh, hazard and property characteristic content that we collect and we start to have a better understanding of not just how to automate underwriting, but how to maybe pre-underwrite risks. And so we've been moving down that path with our clients. And then with the uh, onboarding of the Myriad acquisition a few years ago, the Product Underwriting Center, 
it really is a, a very nice digital workbench for carriers to automate their underwriting workflow. And we've been connecting now the dots between underwriting and claims, where Claims Connect from Simbility has a very similar role in the claims ecosystem. So when you start to look at combining the information about the property in real time, look at combining then the, the workflow, it's a pretty exciting place to be where we can now you know, fuse these two worlds and build uh, you know, a more open standard with all of the partners and the insured techs and the carriers in the, in the market to, to truly you know, kind of answer the question of what if, you know, what, what is possible now that you know, we, we can take that next step forward. So it's been very exciting. We've had similar discussions with our risk management business where we do a lot of probabilistic modeling and helping to uh, increase the granularity of those exposure databases, advance the science in the models, and truly help risk management customers globally uh, embrace open standards. And you know, we see these barriers to innovation everywhere in terms of you know, people locked into vendor platforms, mm-hmm. vendors not supporting open standards. It's not just claims that happens in risk management and a number of areas. And we think we can be part of the answer that now that we have really you know, enterprise grade solutions integrated, that we can be part of the future of the industry to embrace those open standards and find a new way of how workflow should be connected. Well, if there's anything, I mean, Core Logic is known for being open to partnerships and to having connected APIs with several insure tech companies, many that we've spoken to. I first knew of it on the Simbility side, but it seems like Core Logic is. Is that the philosophy of Core Logic to be able to get data any way possible and then to be able to really slice and dice it and give it back out to its customers? Is that the thought? It is because you don't have to go far if you look into the auto space and, and really how standard open standards have fostered innovation. You know, that, that's really what we think is next here for our industry and, and specifically in the claims market. Why we've invested in, in, you know, a level one sponsorship with PIRC, being an active member of those committees, because look, at the end of the day, I, I don't think there can be, technology is moving so quickly that artificial barriers to innovation, they're going to get pushed out of the way. And so we have to core logic, we have to have a business model that embraces that future and that eventuality. So as we're thinking about our digital hub alliance, which is our version of that network, we have to think about it in a few ways. One is what do our clients want? What are the technologies? Who are the insured techs that are solving important problems that you know reduce cycle time, improve customer experience? And then next, we have to figure out what information is involved in that technology or that workflow. Look, it's not about who has the most logos in our integration network. It's about the quality of those interactions, you know, with the supply chain, with TPAs out to the field. And that's really what's behind the standards movement is when we think about an integration, it's not about moving PDF reports back and forth and, and you know, putting a stamp on it. It's saying, what is the unique nature of this service, of this provider, of this technology, and how will it change the workflow? We have to build that into our platform. That's our philosophy behind our Digital Hub Alliance is to say, hey, and we have a class of solutions. So if we're doing, let's say, you know, remote sensing or post-event imagery or you know, roof reports, you know, there's multiple providers of these solutions in the industry. So we can build one optimized integration and through standard APIs, plug in who a carrier wants to do business with. But there are some truly unique offerings out there that have unique data, and we need to t- partner with those companies in a way that we can actually change the workflow. So we've been thinking about this digital hub concept for a while, and we just launched formal program earlier this year, Lee, to truly get to, to where you're going, which is you know, have a really an industry-driven collaboration, whether it's supply chain-driven or carrier-driven. We're not really here to just you know, shift data around it. We're, we're really trying to solve a different problem. And, and that's our business model. And I think that's one that we feel can sustain us and, and really embrace change and, and, and help us get behind it. Even if that means perhaps uh, uh, one of our clients wants a, a competing solution through our platform, you know, we're, we're supportive of that. And that's something that we're going to provide for them. Right. And that, that was my thought exactly was that there are many carrier customers who uh, have something that they prefer. W- what use does it do for you to say, stop preferring that <laughs> so that you can use the rest of our of our suite as opposed to that's great we'll integrate that i mean is that kind of how you think about it it is i mean we're a for profit business so we'd love if every one of our customers used everything we have but reality is we'll never be the best at everything nobody will 
But if we build interoperability properly, then our clients will have flexibility and choice. And it's such a critical thing. You know, we've, we've seen recently some of the uh, rating agencies have included technology innovation as a measurement of a carrier's financial you know, viability. Right. And yeah. we need to get the plug and play because there's just not enough IT resources in any world, whether it's supply chain or carrier, to start from scratch every time we want to plug in a new technology. So you know, we're looking at this as if we make that investment through partnerships and open standards, um, we should be able to give our clients choice of who they want to do business with. And uh, really any any partner that's got scale and, and meets basic security and, and viability criteria should be able to participate. So that's been our philosophy, Rob, and, and one that has is, been pretty exciting because really every quarter now we're launching you know, new workflows that are really market driven. And that's something that we know from Symbility and that, you know, culturally Symbility was a perfect fit for you guys. And that's what we hear from the people at Symbility. One example that popped into my head was Hover. Hover is a tool on the claims side that has gained so much traction. Mm -hmm. To lock Hover out, it means saying no. And that's n never a really good thing to say to a customer if you can avoid it. And, and you guys integrated with them and, and we use that solution today, the hover integration with Symbility and it works really well. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it, that's a, a great example, Rob, because when we look at, at what hover can do and, and there's other ways to capture data in the field, but there's certain areas of data capture that hover do that are quite unique. And so when, when Pascal and our product team sits down with, with AJ and team, you know, the question is what can we do with that unique data and what you know, how can we make this integration more efficient? So that's a discussion we had, and we're really excited about that. And there's been some some publications of those workflows, and, and I'm glad you're getting value from them. We did the same thing with Hover on the underwriting side. We had a number of clients using our underwriting center platform who wanted to get the benefit of that capture as part of their underwriting workflow. And so we've actually done the same thing on the underwriting side. And, and that's, to me, the, the excitement of having a uh, claims and underwriting digital hub is that we can take one solution like a hover and say our clients want to use it in claims and underwriting that information those workflows should not only work but we should be able to interoperate so if if the customer captured that property for underwriting and then a claim happens we should be able to leverage that information to start the claim file and to really expedite that process so that's how we're thinking about it. it's a great example you brought up and and, and there's dozens of others Underwriting is exactly what I wanted to talk about. Whenever I think of core logic, for some reason I think of claims, but I know it's huge in the underwriting world. And I was going to see if you could just talk a little bit about what are you doing in, in the underwriting world and what separates you from your competition? Well, we're, we, we do have a, a long pedigree in underwriting. In fact, um, I made my way into the organization ultimately right. on the underwriting side as I about, I uh, can't believe it, but over 15 years ago, Judge signed up with, uh, at the time, Marshall Swift Beck or MSB. And so, uh, as I mentioned earlier, as we've acquired different really unique and, and uh, dedicated businesses, there's several acquisitions that really formed the basis of our underwriting platform today. Uh, and on the data and analytics side, it was a lot of the uh, CoreLogic foundation of assessor, appraiser, and property insights together with our geocoding solutions and uh, all the hazard, natural hazard data that came in through the acquisition of CDS Risk Meter. And then of course, on the property information evaluation side, um, uh, merging and integrating with all of the assets of, of MSB, which historically was property information and estimating. In fact, that's a database that has always powered the uh, Symbility product historically uh, around the uh, repair costs and estimating. Um, and then to that, we added the probabilistic data set. So if you think about cat risk modeling for uh, over 180 global perils, so now we take all of the content. And, and today we're, we're uh, well over 90% of the loss cost paid by the industry where we have data that can either predict um, or quantify the likelihood of that loss. Or uh, after the fact, we have weather forensic uh, analysis that will really pinpoint where those losses happen. So if you take all that content and we continue to drive the accuracy and granularity, a lot of our clients look to us to help them with their pricing sophistication, risk selection, monitoring. And then we've also integrated that with the underwriting center workflow, which is effectively a underwriting workbench that all that information can flow through to help carriers optimize their operation. 
So it, it's a pretty broad offering from quote to bind to underwriting, uh, and then of course into risk management. Um, and that's that's the the most exciting thing for me, and I think a lot of our folks here is just the diversity of skill and talent. And we have you know PhDs in almost every discipline of natural hazards and structural engineering and environmental science and you know you name it and seeing all those disciplines come together with construction expertise and knowledge with you know insure tech caliber uh, technology so it's a fun place to be and 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 we could spend all day just you know looking at all our data assets but it's really about partnering with you know our industry to figure out what's next and and that's really um, where i spend my time is is making sure we have our focus and our entrepreneurial spirit um, really uh, dedicated in the right place that can help move our industry forward. And I want to talk about that for a few minutes because you're kind of like a kid in a toy store. I mean, you get to look out on all these different toys in, inside this big playroom, right? And And try to decide and think about which of these toys can we play with and which of these toys, what what toys are missing and how can this toy over here be applicable to uh, the games that I want to play now. I mean, so I want to pick your brain for a few minutes about that unique seat that you have that we're envious of getting to play in that on that playground, you know, every day. I'm sure it's hard and frustrating and, and challenging mm-hmm. at times, but also probably a lot of fun. So let's let's go down that path for a second. I want to talk first about, you know, the overarching issue of our day and that's COVID and the impact of COVID. And I know that you guys early, I saw press releases and stuff coming out from CoreLogic and mostly maybe CoreLogic and Symbility at the time, but other, other areas where you guys had wrapped your arms around the situation and said, here's some stuff. Here are some ideas that we have that can be useful to you today. Because as we know, I'm going to say a month, it might've been longer or shorter, depending on the carrier where people were, you know, just kind of freaking out. How am I going to get my work done? And you guys were, were saying, here's fun toys that you can use. So talk about that for a minute. Tell us about that period. Yeah. COVID. um, I think if I hear the word unprecedented one more time, I'm going to, I'm going to maybe get frustrated and lose it. But here's how we think about it. I, I don't see COVID as, and what we've seen so far, I don't see it as a new day in a sense that all of a sudden we're doing something different than we've ever thought before. Like, it, it's just, it's not that. Because if you look at the forces that have been shaping our industry for the last easily five, maybe decade, you've got what? You've got the consumer experience. Consumers are used to now serving themselves through Amazon and you know Uber and you name your app, right? Pick your favorite app. That's my expectation as a consumer. So when I have a moment of need, what do I usually do? I pick up my phone and I serve my moment of need. I, I order something for Amazon. I, I find a you know a place to eat. I get something delivered. Yet when a consumer has that moment of need and they have a property moment, it, there's, they don't know what to do. They don't have that convenience at their fingertips. And so as an industry, we, we've known that and we've been working towards solutions that can take first notices of loss, that can text people when the storm's coming, that can give them visibility to a claim as it's happening rather than having them to call in the call center five times on average during the claim. And so these are things that we already knew as an industry, we're working towards that. We knew that the professionals, the IAs and adjusters, that we need to make them more efficient because more and more of them are retiring and we have to you know, we have to have a workforce to serve the customer. So these are things we've known. And so we're working towards these productivity workflows. We've been working towards automating the work and giving consumers views. And by the way, cost, right? I mean, cost yeah. take out, being a low cost provider has just been a polarizing force for our industry. It's not just our industry, it's every industry. But I hear a lot of our clients, you listen to their uh, reports to, to Wall Street, they're trying to take not 5%, but 20, 30, 35% costs out of their business. That doesn't happen without automation. And, and it's almost across the board. Underwriting claims, it, it, this isn't specific to uh, to the claims environment. So automation's happening. AI is coming into the mix. And all these things we're testing. We've been testing. We've been piloting. We're trying these things. We have a lot of clients that have moved forward with some of our um 
desk adjusting products and they, they run it in a certain corner of their business. Uh, but there's always that concern of, well, you know, the consumers would rather talk to a person. They'd rather have a person come to the house. And many times that's true and it still is. But what does COVID do? COVID's a catalyst for this change because now all of a sudden consumers don't want somebody showing up at their house. They're not comfortable. They may have an underlying medical condition. And, and as a workforce, I don't know that some of our workforce actually want to be traipsing through someone's house they don't know. So these are the human issues that I think COVID has brought into our industry. And we've seen it so far be a, a very, very strong catalyst for those changes that are already happening. And they're just moving 100 times faster. So a, a client that may have been looking at a desk solution or a consumer app to track or participate in a claim, all of a sudden rolled it out to their whole field. Like it, it just happened in two weeks. So that's where I see a lot of the impact and those things are actually working and consumers are embracing them. And so, you know, all of a sudden that resistance or that perceived resistance uh, perhaps is gone on the consumer side. We've heard that a few times from uh, people in position or like yours or similar in that it became an impetus to use these tools. I mean, these were all toys that were sitting there waiting to be used. But as we know from people who work with carriers every day, the process of implementation at a carrier can take a very long time of them buying in and getting behind changes. And it's funny that you bring that up because I can't tell you how many times I've heard, you know, well, a lot of customers want to be on the phone or a lot of customers want, you know, in-person inspection. But the fact of the matter is, is that because of this, the whole width of demographics are saying, Sure. Yeah. Send me a text. I'll take the picture. That's fine. And I think it's been a moment of discovery for the for the insurance industry. Wouldn't you agree? I absolutely. I'm um, just I prepared a few stats on this because it's been fascinating as we track the adoption. These are really only a few weeks old at this point for clients that just turned this on. Uh, before COVID, you know, when we sent a link to a policyholder with a claim, about two thirds would participate that way. So, you know, pretty good adoption, uh, way more than I think most of our customers expect. But two out of three adults of all uh, cohorts of demographics will participate. About 70% of those through a smart device. So you still get a few people that use the computer or, you know, something like that. But about, um, I'm going to get these stats right, about 70% of those who actually did participate did so within 24 hours. So, okay, within a day, you'll get a response. Since COVID, and we measure this by... You know, the day of the world change of the presidential declaration somewhere around uh, March 13th. Since COVID, as we track these stats, now 60% of those people that participate reply within one hour. So you're going from 70% in a day to now 60% within one hour. So either people are home and they're bored and they're looking for something to do, or you know what? My house is damaged, my property, and I am home. And this is even more of a problem because where am I going to go? right? And I don't want to leave my house. I want to get this fixed right now. So it could be a lot of factors, but you're starting to see, we're starting to see a very, very rapid adoption, not just in terms of total people participating, but how quickly they engage and frankly, how quickly they expect action, right? Because of all these other factors on their minds. So has it also helped you to see from this perch you sit on, wow, this is missing or here's an opportunity that I didn't see before this. Or can you talk about that? Yeah, sure. I mean, I don't think this is rocket science, but um, the biggest blocker to all of, like if, if as an industry, if we could have solved for this experience five years ago, we would have. It's not like there's anything that I just discussed that as an industry, we weren't already aware of. We have to make things virtual. We have to make things easier for consumer. But property is not easy. It's just not. It's right. complicated. It's messy. No two losses are the same. It needs professional judgment, right? Is this even covered loss? Yes, it is. Okay, well, what was actually damaged? Where did the water go? Is there mold? So there's so many complicating factors here combined with the fact that many of us, we, we still, you know, within, let's say, five years ago, we still didn't even know what the house was. Like, we didn't have access to the underwriting file. If there was an appraisal, we didn't have a copy of that. If it was listed for sale five years ago... So we are literally as an industry showing up blind to a risk saying, now let me figure out what just happened here. 
I have some of the data from the first notice of loss, but it's not really that complete. So when that's your starting point, there's only so much you can do, right? You're spending your time discovering. Now, as data and analytics, the captures of properties, as we start to share information and think about that consumer's moment, not as a claim event, but as the next moment in the life of a property, and we can pre-fill with what happened from a weather perspective, wind, hail, tornadic damage. We can look at the, the depth of water at that property. We can understand the floor plan. Does it have a basement? Does it, you know, what are the, what's going on at the property? We can now start with a whole different understanding. And perhaps we've even captured that property through an appraisal, through an inspection, or through some other means. Now we can actually start and make that workflow faster, or, or maybe just have the consumer upload some photos and let the AI decide that nine times out of 10, this is a relatively simple claim, but in the one case it's not, or the five that it's not, you know, we need to have experts there. So I think it's about taking the expertise of the industry and deploying it a little more smartly every day. And I think that's what's different now is that we have much more insights into the property and the events at the property than we've ever had before. And that's really opening up a new set of innovation. I forget who said that at our open house, uh, it might've been Robin Robertson, but, uh, you know, technology will never be as slow as it is today, right? It'll only get faster. And, and if that doesn't scare you a little bit, then uh, I don't know what would. Well, speaking of fast technology, we have AI and machine learning, which are buzzwords out there in our industry right now. What is CoreLogic doing to really give a straight through processing of a claim using machine learning and AI? What are you doing with that? Well, I'd, I'd say it's safe to say that we're probably doing a lot of the same things as, as others are doing, which is, you know, if you just take the progression of let's understand what likely happened, or we're partnering with some clients to see if we can actually figure out what happened in some cases, even before we get a phone call. So we know from our forensics data that a severe convective storm happened. We can chart the wind speed. We can chart the hail size. We, do, we know if a tornado came through. We understand how much inundation you know, hit the area and is there flash flooding. So we're starting by looking at if we match that up against you know, claims experience, property characteristics, can we predict which homes are going to have you know, what type of damage? And, and again, that's, that's not a new concept, but you have to have the data to do the model. So you have to point AI at a problem that you have enough experience and exposure to, uh, to solve. So I think there's some, some, some real opportunities in that front for the industry. Uh, to continue to look at resource deployment and optimize. Um, there's certainly an opportunity as we think about how to then go to scope and how do we you know, automate image to scope. That's also not a new concept, but again, it's about pointing the AI and the machine learning at a problem that's solvable and doing it in a way in partnership with others because I think part of the barrier to the industry's innovation is if I'm a large carrier, I'm either going to do that myself or perhaps I don't want to share my data because that's my competitive advantage. And if I'm a data provider or analytics provider, you know, my, my view may be, well, I want to build a model, but I want you to license my model. You know, I, I don't know how sustainable that is. This is amazing technology. I've never seen, if you look at image extraction, I've never seen on claims and underwriting something go from there's some really, really capable AI ML startups out there on both claims and underwriting. They can do amazing things with an image. And three years ago, that was unbelievable. Now uh, it's actually pretty commoditized. So the question is, okay, you have to have the image, you have to have the experience to you know, train the model what to do. It's, it's got a critical role for industry, but what's the business model going to be for AI moving forward? I think it needs to be collaborative. And, and I'm coming to the conclusion that we need to do this with our clients and not expect this to be the next big you know, moneymaker because ultimately, there's a very fine line between what an industry provider like CoreLogic can do with AI ML and what a carrier is going to want to do uniquely to their claim workflow, their process, or perhaps their underwriting. So this is a fascinating area. We know now, I think, what the capabilities of AI machine learning are. I think the business model of how we innovate as an industry is going to be important. So we're spending a lot of time with that with our clients, looking at how we build sustainability there, what they actually will want from a supplier like us or our partners in the future. And frankly, if there's an insured tech that's already cracked the atom on some type of AI, I'll just plug it into our platform. I don't need to do that again. So, you know, what is CoreLogic's role in that? Can we do all this? Sure. 
Um, but what we choose to do is going to be important and the rest will just integrate to our digital hub. So, uh, you know, we don't have all that figured out yet. I don't know anyone that does, but uh, we, we're listening to our clients in, in terms of where they need us to apply those methods and um, where we can bring unique value in doing that. And that's where we're going to focus. You are just crazy smart whenever it comes to insurance. And I want to hear a little bit about your story. I'm looking here and it says that that you had a degree in chemical engineering. How did you come uh, from a degree in chemical engineering to being a mastermind of insurance at CoreLogic? Well, I think the, the adage goes that uh, you don't find insurance, insurance finds you. I, I think I've heard some version of that with most of uh, the peers in the industry. But look, I, I, uh, I've always been fascinated with you know, applied sciences. You're in a high school, I was relatively uh, you know, rural slash suburban upbringing in the DC area. And you know, mom's a school teacher. By the way, I have a lot more respect and really appreciation for school teachers uh, having now homeschooling three kids right now with my wife. So shout out to all the teachers out there, or those that, uh, that are married to them, uh, tell them thank you. But my dad was a life insurance agent, and so got a little bit of exp- exposure there to, to the insurance world, but it really wasn't top of mind. And I really love the STEM type curriculum, math, science, applied, you know, engineering. You know, at that point, it was, you know, C++ was brand new and, you know, you, Microsoft was put in their hand. So I went to school and I just, I didn't have a lot of interest in the, uh, the, the pure sciences, but I love the applied, right? So I went into engineering and I don't know why I just looked at a couple different disciplines and I, I, I just, I like the elemental nature of chemistry. So that's what I did. Well, I just started to kind of ask the question, like, what do you want to do when you grow up? Which I'm still trying to answer. <laughs> I, I really love business and entrepreneurialism. And, you know, I had done little lawn mowing businesses, stuff like that as, as I was growing up. And I did some internships. I did some uh, R&D internships and like consumer goods and manufacturing and just wasn't my thing. I, I, I wanted a little bit more you know, ability to create and, and a little bit less hierarchy. And so I went into uh, management consulting. So out of school, um, you know, spent some time in management consulting, just loved the pace. I loved the application of ideas and solving business problems. And, and I really liked that, but got to the point in my career where you, you kind of have to pick either your life or there, or you're going to, I wanted a different experience with my family. So it just serendipity. I got off the road and, um, and, and found this little data analytics with a little bit of technology company called MSB and thought I'd, you know, see what it was like. And, uh, 15 years later, here I am. So, you know, it's kind of one of those things where I just absorbed it like I would any other consulting engagement. And at the time I joined, I really didn't know much about PNC, but I listened to clients and and what they needed and what we could do. And I offered a few suggestions. And uh, at the time, the the leadership said, yeah, that sounds great. Why don't you go do that? And so uh, 15 years later, uh, I get to do that on a bigger stage. So I've just been just really appreciative, you know, of the opportunities I've been uh, given and certainly excited, as you said earlier, about the uh, the platform we have now to be a part of the transformation of our industry. And doing it from Milwaukee. Milwaukee. Well, I I started actually out on the East Coast. Some of your audience may be familiar with the journeyed path of MSB, which at the time had a claim solution that we ultimately sold to Symbility. But about that time, um, uh, our former owners uh, up in Canada sold us to TPG, the private equity firm. And it was really a growth play. They, TPG saw a real amazing platform for investment. And we were three years into that when uh, CoreLogic said, hey, you know, we, we love the assets. We think we should be entering the insurance space. It fits with our vision and our strategy. And, and we like the management team. And we'd like you guys to come on board and, and help us pull this all together. So... It was just, again, right place at the right time, just an amazing opportunity. And when our, when our CEO uh, left, uh, I had the opportunity to move out to Milwaukee and uh, take on the role I have now. So it's just, it's been an exciting journey. And I say I've been here 15 years, but I've worked for four different companies. So it's always stayed fresh. And uh, at this point, given where we are as an industry, it, it's just an amazing platform to, to be, an amazing time to be a part of our industry. Well, with that in mind, we, we have one last question that we like to ask people in positions like yours, where you have really pretty good sight out to the future, you're not encumbered by being too bogged down in just what's going on today, but really having to scout, like we were saying earlier, all the things, all the tools, all the ideas, uh, what's coming, like you said, it's changing faster than we can keep track of. If you go five years down the road and want to pick on claims here, 
what do you think? What do you see when you look five years down with the things that have happened recently and, and, and in general? Give us your thought there in closing. I'm excited for that view. Uh, there's a few things, and I'll just start with a few concepts. Um, I think we're past the tipping point in real-time loss identification, knowing what's happening on the ground due to external factors like convective storm, you know, water, flash flood. Uh, we're, we're the, the science is there that we can, with pretty good accuracy, predict where the losses are happening from that category of losses. I think we'll also be getting there on the inside of the home. So you think about smart devices, connected devices, monitoring. Many of our clients are moving into that very, very quickly. Consumers are adopting these things. So the ability to identify a loss in real time and either mitigate it to actually prevent the damage or to respond in real time. So I think you'll see that consumers will expect it. Many carers will really put their brands behind that type of experience, and, and that's going to happen. From there, I think you're going to see a lot of advancements where most of the industry's is focused, which is in the automation of you know, scope to estimate to assessment of damage. So the, the experts in the field, uh, the adjusters, whether it's contractors, depending on the model or managed repair networks, uh, they're going to have technologies at their fingertips to really, really speed up your cycle time. Um, you know, the, the communications are going to need to get better. I think that's a third thing I see, which is there's really a groundswell happening around uh, interoperability and standards. I, I just it's not quite at a point, a tipping point yet, but I think it's darn close. And uh, especially with the great work that's happening at the uh, at PIRC and, and if the supply chain and vendors like CoreLogic uh, and others, um, can, if we just hold hands and jump, I think we'll get there in the next few years um, to making the system changes needed to, to realize that goal. So when information can start flowing, our companies can collaborate and then all, and then the experience changes. So I think you'll see that. I think um, we'd also like to see, I mean, as an industry, you've got to keep the consumer at the center. And in the claim experience, that's a natural thing. There's now a concept that's it's finally got a name. It's called embedded insurance. And thinking about that consumer's moment inside of the rest of their world. I think the, the claims, because it is a focused event, probably is leading the way there. Uh, you'll see more of that in you know, home purchase, let's say, for personal lines and, and for commercial lines as well. So I think continuing to think about the consumer, not just during the claim event, but throughout the experience until the property is repaired, I think you'll see more capabilities happening, whether it's through managed repair or other business models. Uh, that, that will, I think that will become the, the norm. And then ultimately, I'm excited about, we're starting to see worlds collide a little bit you know, we have the gig economy, we have, you know, all kinds of platforms using spare time. I think when you have experts in the supply chain and contractor and, and other networks where you have contractors that maybe don't participate in claims today because it's too difficult or too many rules or it's too hard, I think you're going to see platforms that make participation of professionals easier. And so with that gig economy, we may be able to tap into a lot more convenience and, and you know, speed and, and uh, just a better customer experience. Because at the end of the day, it's about making the, the policy harder whole. And I think uh, many clients that we're seeing are really focused on those outcomes. Um, and so that also drives a lot of the adoption of standards and interoperability. So, um, you know, uh, I can also guarantee there will be something in the next five years that we can't even imagine today that will be possible. And so we're going to keep our eyes out for those disruptors because eight years ago, I wouldn't have thought about, you know, an Uber, or I wouldn't have thought about, yeah. you know, a lot of things I do every day. So, yeah. so that's the, uh, the black swan. I think we have to keep our eyes to the sky there and, uh, and keep that in focus. Right. And sometimes those solutions are really simple ones that are right in front of us the whole time, like Uber, right? I mean, who would have thought? The simplicity is what makes it work. And that's our challenge, not just at CoreLogic, but as an industry, how do you take something that's normally, there's a thousand reasons why renting a car should be complicated until it's not, mm -hmm. and then it's easy. And how do we do that? So that, you know, Rob, I think uh, uh, you and Lee figure that out and, and we'll, uh, we'll be rich people, but we're going to keep at it until we try. We're going we're gonna to try and make this experience simple with our partners. Well, we do know the guy that does, you know, some of the acquisition work at CoreLogic, so we could always approach him and uh, <laughs> with with our great idea. Uh, Keep it simple. It's an age-old adage, and it's as true today as ever. Well, listen, now we know why we were so willing to patiently wait for you to to finally get you on the show. <laughs> uh, you're, a, you're a fountain of information. 
uh, who has a great seat in this business. We've loved having you on and hearing what you had to say. And I hope that at some point in time, maybe in a year or so, you'd join us again, maybe when we can all like see each other in person. A nice in-person visit. We can always dream. <laughs> <laughs> I'm starting to refer to BC uh, before COVID. So I think yeah. we can all wish for those days very soon. Well, I'm sure that AC will see you at some function like we usually do. And thanks. Really appreciate having you. Thanks. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. You know, sometimes we have co-founders or CEOs or stuff like that, which is always very interesting. But Steve might have one of the more interesting jobs of anybody we've interviewed. Yeah, he has a, a huge job. And he's been in the industry a long time. And through merger and acquisition, he has found his way to CoreLogic. And is seems like he's really doing a great job there. Uh, when he was talking about COVID, I think he's right. We were able to implement as an industry so many workflows and technologies that we've been working on for five and 10 years that many insurance carriers weren't quite ready for. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's not like we had to invent anything new. We just had to actually implement that which we had invented. And uh, it seems like, like they're doing a great job. I, for one, know for sure that they had the technology in place and the workflows in place to, to meet the client's needs. And it sounds like he thought it all out. Sure. You know, we didn't really talk that much about Simbility um, during, the, during the episode, but we do business with CoreLogic every day, right? Yeah. I mean, we do, we do a lot of business with them. And it's interesting when you dig deeper down, I mean, the layers of that company are incredible. Uh, a massive data company uh, f with billions of different records uh, to pull data from. It's it's stunning what you think of the possibilities uh, to, to do with that. And even particularly when you just boil it down to one piece of the puzzle of the claims business. Right. I often think about the people who have the job of looking at the billion lines of data and thinking, what can I do with this? What industry can we go into? How can I perfect another industry? What what can I do with all this data? And like you said, they have people with PhDs of all sorts working at CoreLogic, just some of the smartest people out there. And, and with their willingness to connect to the intro techs that we talked about, like Hover and many, many others that we've talked about, they are, I mean, they, they've got it together. They're doing a, a great job. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a very exciting time, especially for a guy in that position. Uh, I think that it's a very interesting time. But what a hard job back to, I can't, I can't get over that yeah. interesting, fun, mm -hmm. but to cobble out a strategy from all the different ways you could go with that. I mean, m many of the tools that we, the people that we interview and the people that we talk to, it's pretty defined, you know, what, what they can do with their tools or the range of things. But, but this goes, this kind of goes on and on and on to make the final decisions that these, this is the product mix that we're going to bring to market for insurers. Wow. That's, that's hard. It is. Well, I so, look forward to having them back on the podcast yeah, in maybe a yeah. year and just seeing what does post COVID look like? Right. Did we stick with our path or did we change? Right. Right. It'll be uh, a, what, what do we call it now? AC after COVID, right? Yeah, well, yeah, that was BC. Now it's AC again. Okay, so we're in... DC, I guess, during COVID. Yeah, DC. I like uh, that. I guess we're waiting for AC. I guess we're in DC. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. I yeah. was in DC. Well, that's a whole other story. Yeah. Well, listen, we thank Steve for being with us. Great to have a guest like him well worth our wait. And we thank you for being with us and for spending time with us and listening to the stories that we have and that we bring to the airwaves. And uh, with that, we'll say what we always say. First, we'd like to also say thank you, Astrid. As we've said, thank you for the, uh, oh, for the yeah. uh, recommendation there. And yeah, with that. And mm -hmm. Steve told us afterwards, that Astrid, that you are a, a remarkable resource for strategy and decision-making. If anyone's interested to know about you, they should contact FNO and we'll, we'll fill them in. But you can check out stratmaven.com stratmaven.com and with that we'll say goodbye everybody <laughs>